Hello again, I'm Lule Demise, president of Ally Invest, and I'm excited to welcome Andy Hill for the next segment of our session today. Good morning, Andy. Uh, good morning. Good to see you. So before we get started, I just want to do one housekeeping uh, request, which is for folks who are watching us, start sending your questions through even as you're watching us right now. So we will have um, the questions be able, we will be dedicating at least 10 minutes, if not more, to your questions and not just my own, uh, to Andy, because he'll have a lot of interesting insights to share with you. So Andy, let me just tell folks a little bit about you. Uh, Andy will be giving us a primer on the fascinating and growing movement known as FIRE, which stands for St Financial Independence, Retire Early. Andy is an award-winning blogger and a podcaster behind Marriage, Kids, and Money. And I can attest because I was watching hours of him yesterday. He's dedicated to helping young, young families build wealth and thrive. Uh, his personal ex financial experience has been featured in major media outlets like CNBC, Business Insider, Market Watch, NBC News, and much more. And his marriage of, for, message of family financial, financial independence and empowerment has resonated with listeners and readers and viewers across the country. We are so pleased to have you, Andy. When Andy's not talking money, he enjoys wrestling with his kids, singing karaoke with his wife, and watching Marvel, Marvel movies. Go Captain Marvel. Uh, I can attest to that for my kids as well, Andy. Um, so thanks so much again for joining us today. Um, and so let's get started first about you telling us what is FIRE uh, for the layperson who doesn't, who is not part of this movement. Yeah, Lule, thank you so much for having me. I, I appreciate uh, being here today. So as you said, yeah, FIRE, uh, the FIRE movement stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. So there's really two parts, and sometimes there's a slash between the, the two letters uh, for that very reason, because the first part is financial independence. And that essentially means when you no longer have to work for money, or you have enough passive income that covers your annual living expenses. And then the second side of that is the retire early side. And that essentially means you can stop working in the traditional sense. You can quit your J-O-B and do more of uh, what you want to do. So that's that's what FIRE is, is about. Terrific. And I know people think that FIRE is a rich man's option or a rich woman's option. And I know it couldn't be farthest from the truth. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But, you know, having interviewed the over, I think, 100 people you've done so um, in, as they pursue this life, what is what have you seen? What are the what is what is it that draws people to this movement, do you think? Yeah, I think it's the aspect of the independence part, the freedom part. I think everybody can resonate with wanting more time in their lives. I think that really can resonate with really anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So as somebody's working at a traditional job and maybe they're working 60 to 80 hours a week and they've been in, at it for a while, maybe they're just not feeling like they have enough time to do the things that they really want to do. So the commute is maybe getting to them, the yeah. hours, dealing with bosses or management that you don't see eye to eye with. And so a, a lot of folks get to the movement at that point where they're saying, well, what are my options? How do I retire early? How do I leave traditional work? And, and some people just want to have more time with their family or time with their kids to to, you know, to raise them and, and create those memories. So there's lots of varying reasons, but those are the reasons that I've found from the folks that I've interviewed. Got it. So I saw one of your po podcast uh, interviews with Michael Lacey, I believe his name is. And mm -hmm. he said something about, you know, he said something that really struck me that I thought was really wise. He said he and his wife um, looked at their financial sort of combined financial picture and they had this great material life but when they actually pulled back the curtain, what they saw was a combined picture of debt, not assets. Tell us a little bit about that experience and that aha moment a lot of folks feel before they start tinkering and embracing fire. Yeah, for, for Michael's story, which was very interesting, they got married and they were both doing really well. I think as he r recounted to me, he was, they were making maybe like $120,000 a year and they were living for today. They were having a lot of fun. They were traveling. They were buying the things that they wanted to buy, getting expensive cars. And that's just sort of the stuff that um, they thought they should do. And then as they started their marriage and went on their honeymoon, they kind of had some realizations that maybe they're spending a little bit more than they actually have. And the credit card debt is piling up a little bit more than that it should be. And at that point, they sort of had that realization of maybe we're living a life that we shouldn't be living. Maybe we're living a life that we're told to be living. 
And at that point, they decided, what can we do to erase debt from our lives in order to have the future and the time freedom that we would like in the future? And that's that's really where their story started. Yeah. And, you know, what's fascinating is, you know, another perspective that I've you know heard a lot from folks who are members of the FIRE movement is that, you know, it's not just about retiring early. It's about, for instance, if you do decide to stay in a job or do something working, whether it's for yourself or other people, that moving towards this lifestyle gives you a mental freedom that allows you to perform at your peak, which I thought was so compelling. Who does not want to, you know, whether we think we can afford to retire or not, who does not want to perform at their peak in whatever they do? Um, Tell us a little bit about in your life where examples of where you found that you're performing at your peak now that you've pursued this. Yeah, I would say uh, there's been a lot of advantages as I've found the FIRE movement. And one of the major ones is just analyzing my true annual expenses. Because, you know, as you're floating through life, you know, you buy the things you want, you, you know, you save in areas you think you're supposed to save in. But until you actually look at the numbers and lay them all down, um, that is a, an op- eye-opening moment. And it was for me, too, as uh, we've been creating our budget and looking at that on a monthly basis for quite a while now. Uh, recently, over the past couple of years as I found the FIRE movement. Um, It's allowed me to have some introspection into the things that are most important to me. And as my wife and I analyzed those numbers and looked at things, we found our happy spot to be around $60,000 a year, $60,000 to $70,000 per year, depending on, you know, what stage of life we're in and and, uh, the two kids that we have and the activities they're involved in. So uh, I'd say one of the most major advantages that we've found is just realizing that what you spend per year can have a lot of power in your life. And, you know, being able to flex that gives you a lot of power as well. So that's been one of the most uh, eye-opening advantages so far for us. Yeah. So let's get into, now that we've piqued people's interest in terms of some of the benefits of this to one's lifestyle, let's get into a little bit of the anatomy of fire. So tell us a little bit about what's the, what are the different levels of living within the fire, within the fire construct, lean fire, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's kind of fun to to look into some of these ideas because everybody's got different ideas of what it is. But generally, you know, traditionally your fire number is defined by 25 times your annual expenses. So that way you can do a safe withdrawal rate of 4% per year. Now, there's a lot of debate around that, especially for early retirees, because that 4% is comfortable for somebody who's going to have maybe a 30-year retirement. But if you're retiring in your 30s or your 40s, you know, you got a lot longer to to go. So uh, some, some say, that the 4% withdrawal rate might be too aggressive, maybe a 3% withdrawal rate might be more in line. So if you look at these different levels, like lean fire, fire, or fat fire, um, you know, if we use the 4% as example, a lean fire would be somebody who needs $40,000 per year for their annual expenses. So that would, uh, by that 4% withdrawal rate, that would mean you need a million dollars invested in order to pull back on that per year in order to live comfortably. Uh, regular fire or traditional fire is around that $60,000 per year level. So that would mean you'd need $1.5 million invested. And then fat fire is like, you know, you're living large and, and you haven't having a good fun life is $100,000 or more, depending on what that's defined for you. So 100000 or more would be $2.5 uh, million invested. But if you're thinking of that 3% withdrawal rate, that would be upwards of, you know, $3.3 million. So It's a lot of savings and a lot of investing that needs to happen in order to make some of those levels happen. That's why there's a, a, you know, big swath of people that are interested in lean fire and then just decreasing their expenses to a level where, hey, you know, we're pretty happy living in one of the most privileged countries in the world and and living at $40,000 per year. It's pretty comfortable. And it helps out a lot if you're able to reduce your expenses quite a bit. You know, outside of investments, you can pursue fire through real estate or you can pursue it through small business ownership as well. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting about this is sort of, I think part of what so many people struggle, I know in my own personal life, my own family, um, it's helping people to understand how to have trade-offs, right? Because I think at the end of the day, everybody knows they're not going to get everything under the sun in their world, in their life, right? I, I think that we underestimate people's you know, ability to, under, to be realistic. But I, I think the, what, the thing that attracts me about FIRE is this, again, this idea of trade-off, which you just explained, right? Which size fits for you? 
Tell me a little bit about, um, in your interview experiences, what are some of the stories that have, that really bring to life these examples that you just told us? Yeah, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. Uh, Dylan Redling was a man I interviewed almost about four years ago uh, when I sort of found this fire movement and I got super interested in it. He retired at 43 years old with his wife, Allison, um, and their situation was kind of unique. They had both uh, got let go from their jobs right around the same time in their you know, early 40s. And they decided, hey, you know what, instead of going back to our tech careers where it's been kind of hectic and you know, we've been going in and out of, uh, of different positions. Let's take a, let's take a year off. Let's take a sabbatical and decide, you know, you know, what, what our next path is. And as they were on that, you know, sabbatical, they sort of calculated their annual expenses a little further and realized that they had saved up enough through their investments to retire already. So, uh, they were a couple that sort of, you know, I would say, uh, really frugal all-stars because they had saved for so long. And it's just part of their nature being frugal to invest and save through retirement, uh, investments as well. And they had amassed 50 times their income. So at that point they felt very, very comfortable to live on $36,000 per year, in Northern California, by the way, wow. which is which is quite difficult. Yeah, um, but, a lot of uh, free they... wine tastings, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Hey, <laughs> whatever, whatever they could do, right? Yeah. But they've been traveling more, uh, you know, since they've done their retirement, and they still work a little bit. Uh, you know, he's writing a book and, uh, and a blog, but a lot of it's just for for you know personal joy as opposed to having to work. Um, so he's one of a, a great example on, on the sides of things that I, I saw as almost like a success story for me, somebody who's done really well frugally, and then they just both seem very happy with the decision they've made, and they're living a great life together. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is another thing I've found is that when people start hearing about living within this movement or starting to adopt some of its best practices, um, some of the assumptions that come out is that either people are stingy with their money or they don't spend on things that make them happy. And I found that that couldn't have been farther from the truth. Tell us a little bit of examples, whether it's in your life or otherwise, that FIRE actually has given you the freedom to be more generous where you want to be intentional and also are spending on things that can make you actually happy. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I, and, and the whole exercise that we discussed about analyzing your expenses is a great place to start with that because sometimes we're spending money on things we don't even know about, whether it's subscriptions or or just kind of looking at some of the bigger expenses like housing and transportation and food and realizing that some small changes in your life could make a huge impact. So for example, uh, in our lives, we saw one of the largest line items in our budget was our mortgage. And we said, well, we love living in our house. We don't want to downsize or or change where we live or anything like that. What if we just paid off our mortgage? That would be that would eliminate one large item from our from our budget each month. And that's something that we work together on as a as a couple. And it became a goal of ours. So looking at some areas that were like, well, this doesn't necessarily bring us joy to pay this mortgage, so why don't we get rid of it? But on the flip side, we love our cleaning lady, so we want to keep that in our budget, <laughs> right? It. That makes us yeah. both happy, right? And and also other things uh, like uh, having our kids in summer camps or teaching my daughter how to play soccer and sign her up for those types of things. Those are the things that bring me joy, and actually, through this whole process, uh, it's allowed us to give more uh, in our in our in our charitable giving. Uh, back in 2017, we were giving maybe one percent to of of our of our annual exp or, of our income, and uh, through uh, just some introspection and looking at our budget and kind of deciding what's important in life, we said well, let's let's see if we can ladder that up. So over the past couple of years, 2018, we decided to give three percent, and then in 2019, we gave five percent. So we've been able to grow and sort of look at the things that are most important to us in our budget while still pursuing a life of financial independence. Yeah. Do you think you have to be financially savvy to start this process? In other words, like, is 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 this harder for people who just don't find any of the numbers game interesting? Um, and is it almost prohibitive, if you will? I think if you start out trying to figure out your safe withdrawal rate and how quickly you can do it and yeah. all these very difficult things, then yes, I think that can be very overwhelming. But if I think if you look at things in a small baby step kind of format, like saying, hey, 
start with tomorrow just building your budget and deciding how much you feel comfortable spending each year. And then the next week, figure out how you can reduce expenses that don't actually kill your joy, as we're talking about here, right? Yeah. What other ways? And then the, the week after that, look at ways to increase your income. So if you just look at it in steps over time, then maybe it's not so overwhelming. But yeah, if you look at, well, I want to retire in five years and I got to give up everything in order to do it, then yeah, you might get overwhelmed and it might seem impossible and it might cause some strife in your life as well. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you factor family into this process, right? Because one person can feel really passionate about pursuing this and the other spouse can feel it, that it's it's not for them or it's constraining. Get, can you give us a little bit of the story? First, your personal journey as a family, mm -hmm. but also people who have had to resolve that difference, if you will. Yeah, I'm um, happy to share our, our side of things. So I found the FIRE movement at a time where I was really dissatisfied with my work, you know, and uh, it was one of those things where I had been working in a career for 15 years and I, I was either bored or frustrated or something, but I had just been doing it for too long. I've been traveling too long. And it just was one of those things where it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, there's been management changes and I just don't want to deal with this anymore. So hearing the, the message of the fire movement got me excited. Oh, there's my way out, right? There's my way to, to move things forward. Um, but through some, you know, uh, some, some investigation and and starting to talk about that with my wife, we learned that there are some areas that we are happy to give up on, and then there are some areas we are not happy to give up on. Yeah. You know, so for example, as we were looking over our expenses, you know, grocery shopping became one of those things where it's like, hey, if we move from Kroger to Aldi, we can save about thirty-six hundred dollars a year, and that'll help us to get closer to this goal. You know, in the beginning, that became sort of a, well, do we really want to do this? But as we checked it out, it wasn't that bad. And, and she agreed. You know, cutting cable was something we agreed on. But then when it came to the cleaning lady or home decor, things like that, those were sort of the stopping points for my wife. And, um, you know, it ended up causing some uh, discussions, arguments that, that caused us to, um, you know, have some money fights, which was not fun for our family. And, but, you know, I, I talk about my wife on that side of things, about the things that she wasn't willing to give up, but I also wasn't yeah. willing to give up certain things too, like yeah. traveling with my family and, you know, uh, having my kids in sports. So yeah, there's a lot of discussions that needed to happen around that. But once I got myself out of the numbers talk and more into the dreaming conversation with my wife of, Hey, wouldn't it be great if we were both able to, you know, spend a little bit more time with the kids, if we were able to travel more together and spend less time working. When I was able to, you know, carry the conversation in that fashion, the conversation was a little bit easier than saying, "Hey, we need to have a 4% safe withdrawal rate from our, you know, from our 1.5 million that we need to save up." It's it's a little bit more robotic and less human as as my friend Michael Lacey said, um, to um, to have those types of conversations. So yeah, it can cause some strife, but if you're able to approach the conversation in a way that is beneficial to both parties, I think that it's a little easier to have. Yeah, I love that talking more dream and less just numbers. Um, it's interesting, you know, because I feel like part of the process of getting open and courageous about money um, and between couples and families, I think actually is one of the more healing things we do for our families. So I think that, you know, the other benefit is it's not just about the money. It's the, just the ability to have transparent, courageous conversations with one another, that practice that comes with it, which is awesome. So tell Absolutely. us a little bit about, so before we go on, actually, I just want to do another housekeeping announcement, which is, folks, put in your questions now, uh, because we will be shifting to your questions and not just mine um, as we get through this. Um, tell me a little bit about how there are moments and uh, practices within your life, at least, as you adopted FIRE, that you felt, okay, this piece does not work for me. And can you tell us why it didn't work for you? Or your family, yeah. or your wife for that matter? Absolutely, so one big piece of the puzzle for us was, well, if we're gonna do this financial independence thing, we're gonna need to save up a quite a bit of money to either invest in the stock market or buy real estate. And for us, real estate sounded like the best route for us. Uh, as we're a little bit older and our time for compound interest in the market would take quite a bit longer. So we said, well, let's just save up a bunch of money and buy some real estate. So my wife and I started looking at properties and in the Detroit metro 
metropolitan area, there's uh, reasonable uh, homes that you can buy and rent out. So we started looking at homes together and my version of a, you know, a, a good starter rental property was very different from her version of a starter rental property. And we started to go into it and realize that both of us, whether, whether we like the version or not, didn't really want to jump in and become landlords. And in order to become landlords, we're essentially adding on another job or another responsibility that might actually cause us less time with our family and more time managing a new job. So for us, this was sort of a, a journey for us to look into, well, how can we retire early and how can we find this financial independence? And real estate became the idea, but then as we investigated it, it really wasn't something that we both wanted to do. So we've abandoned that as, as, as an yeah. idea for our for our financial independence plan. And we're both really happy about the finality of us saying, we're not going to be real estate investors and we're okay with that. Yeah, that, that, that's terrific. Because I do think part of it is like, if you don't open your mind to tinkering with this, then you feel like, okay, I failed in this one thing. So the whole thing didn't work for me. So I think it's, I thank you for sharing that with us. How about some of the best things that have happened to you based in your interests on fire? Just tell us some either transformative relationships, anything that's happened in your lifetime that's really been, if you, if you had to actually thread it to, it's because you started this journey. Yeah, I would say uh, some of the best things that have happened to us through this process is we've eliminated spending on things that don't bring us joy. And uh, for, for, for some of those things, there's this, there's a movement right now outside of the fire movement. It's just a, a movement for minimalism as well and, yeah. and having less waste yeah. and uh, just general consumerism. And we're looking at that as a way for us to reduce stress in our lives, you know, and that's been able to allow us to have some conversations with our kids about what's important and what is needed in our lives. So it's helped us to bring up some great conversations with our children about do we really need all of these toys? Do we really need uh, to spend and go to every single birthday party that we're invited to? Or, or do we, are we excited about having more relaxation time? And so it's, it's, it's caused us to think not only about our spending, but also about how we allocate our time and how we allocate the stuff in our lives. And that is definitely something that both my minimalist wife and I both see eye to eye on. So it's been one of those things where we come together and say, this has been great. But outside of that, I mean, I've connected with some amazing human beings uh, who are pursuing fire and I've learned so much from them about finding happiness, you know, and everybody's different version of happiness. And with that, uh, it takes a lot of introspection to figure that out. And some of those conversations, as you mentioned, Lule, is, you know, having those open to, to have dialogue with your spouse about what their true happiness is. And yeah. once we find that middle ground together, I think that's a, a recipe for a great marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of kids, I mean, the fact that you've cracked any code on buy that, buy that, I want that is, is going to be something people want more to hear about. So how did you bring the, the kids into this process? And, and what's that been like? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I've, I'm kind of a money nerd. So I've had a lot of discussions with my, with my daughter uh, ever since she was a young girl. And a big part of our discussion at home is through contributions. So uh, every Saturday morning, our kids get up and they have a set of chores that they need to do. And the reason we do this is one, because we'd like a little help around the house. <laughs> and then two is to show them that with hard work uh, nets you a reward. So and uh, by doing that, we're going to be paying our, our kids a uh, dollar for every year they are old. You know, so so my daughter is eight and she gets eight bucks. My, my son's five. He gets five bucks. And with that, those uh, those dollars start to become conversations about what's important in life. So they have a spend jar, a save jar, a give jar, a college jar and an invest jar. So with all of those jars becomes great conversations for us to talk about. Uh, personal finance, how it's important to understand where your money is going and how you are utilizing it. Instead of it all being for spending, you know, we want to have conversations about the importance of saving and investing at an early age so that those conversations and ideas can be something that they've lived through throughout their childhood and they're moving forward in, in, in their adult life. And with that, you know, we have some conversations about smart spending too. So, you know, whatever's in the jar, you can't just go off and spend all the time. 
uh, we limit their purchases to about one, you know, larger purchase per month. So that way they're going to the store, buying the one thing that they're really happy about and getting some use out of it. And if they want to have some more toys and more things to play with, then yeah, there's a lot of toys in our house already that are hiding in these bins that we've, uh, you know, we've put out there. So try to be creative, try to get outside, try to do things outside of, of consuming because we don't want to train them to always want more and be dissatisfied with the $10 toy they just bought and throw it to the side. So we've had a lot of conversations with them about that, but it, it just starts with you know, starting early and, and starting those conversations as soon as possible. Well, first of all, I think you should actually turn those jars into an infographic and post them somewhere because <laughs> I know I'd be printing it out and showing it to my wife as to how we should be I'm by helping them bifurcate their, uh, their money. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, like being a child, peer pressure is that much more stronger, right? How do you coach them if they have, I mean, because the, the lifestyle you're pursuing is not necessarily <laughs> you know, the, the, the common path, if you will. So yeah. like, how do you help them navigate peer pressure around this consumerism? That's a great, that's a great point. We live in a really well-to-do community as well. So we, uh, sometimes Nicole and I feel like outsiders, sometimes lots of doctors and lawyers where we live. And, you know, between me being a, a blogger and her being a secretary, sometimes we feel like, uh, sometimes we feel like outsiders. Um, but you know, some of those conversations are starting to happen a little bit more now with my, with my eight-year-old daughter where she comes home and, you know, somebody has this thing or somebody's house looks like this. And we try to encourage her that being different is great. Being different is cool. And uh, we don't want to be like everybody else. We want to be individuals. And sometimes that's diff difficult to explain to kids. But over time, we're hoping that she understands that her differences, whether it's the way she looks, whether it's the way she dresses, or her viewpoints being different, are actually what makes her unique. And so we want to encourage being unique. We want to encourage being different because that allows us to you know, help her to understand that not everybody's the same and uh, allows her to be tolerant of other folks that are yeah. not the same and accepting of folks that aren't the same. So I think it's a broader conversation that uh, we're starting to have right now and, and having a lot of fun with. That's amazing. That's wonderful. As the French say, I guess, vive la différence, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> tell us now a little bit about where you are in your fire journey, if you don't mind giving that level of transparency to our uh, viewers in terms of where you are and what, what's left in your journey for fire. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, you know, in order to reduce our expenses, we were able to pay off our mortgage. That's been something that has uh, changed our lives. I mean, it's uh, we had a lot of extra money to use at that point. And, and at that point, we decided, well, let's save up and buy that rental property so we can pursue fire. And then recently, we decided, well, let's not do that anymore. Let's have you finally transition out of the career that doesn't bring you joy and just use that money we've saved up for rental properties as your runway. So that, that's been what I've been doing over the past couple of months. In January, I made a transition outside of my full-time career that I'd been working in for 15 plus years to pursue my side hustle full-time as a, uh, a podcaster, podcast producer, um, and it's been fantastic. I have found a schedule over the past couple of months of learning to be an entrepreneur that both my wife and I love. We're both working maybe 30 hours on average per week. I'm allowed to, um, you know, drop my kids off at the bus in the morning, pick them up after school. My wife does the same. We sort of have this great partnership where she's got two days to get them. I got two days to get them. And we both have a little free time when we're not getting them. And it's been fantastic. And I've been able to spend a lot more time with my kids. And, you know, I definitely make about half of what I've made before. So that's been a big change. But since we were saving so much, since we had a savings rate of, you know, almost 50%, uh, it's been something that we've been able to easily transition into. And yes, I'm making a lot less money, but I'm, I'm happier. I'm happier with my days now. Uh, but we're still investing for retirement and we're still investing for, you know, pre-retirement, you call it. Uh, but we're definitely not doing real estate, pursuing that, except for uh, REITs. You know, we're buying some REIT ETFs and things like that to help us and diversify and be in real estate without actually owning real estate. So we're still very interested in financial independence. And um, I've just found my current version of it through changing how I work. And I'm not sure that I ever want to cease working, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I love work. Yeah. I, I love giving back. Um, I love uh, helping people. So if I'm able to find work that makes me happy, where I make a little bit of money doing it, then I'm a happy guy. 
Yeah, you know, I was talking to our chief um, investment strategist, Lindsay, about like, I think re retirement doesn't mean to stop working. It just means that one day we will slow down, right? Because we get older, but that doesn't mean that the, the, the work ethic has to go away or the presence of work has to go away. It's just that a little bit of freedom that affords us to do what we want. Um, tell us a little bit about the community around you. In other words, I know that folks who pursue this, um, this lifestyle also have found a broader community that has sort of strengthened um, their approach and um, their resolve to try to stay in, in this lifestyle. Tell us a little bit about some of the broader community that people can access. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and what you said earlier is that not a lot of people are adopting this, right? So sometimes you can feel isolated, but there are thousands and thousands of people who are very interested in financial independence and their own version of retiring early that have made the process so easy from a uh, from a community standpoint where you feel like you can lean on people to say, hey, here's what I'm going through, or here's what my family is saying about my choices with regard to spending money. How do you feel? And it's great to have that you know, that reply or that community, whether it's online or in person where people can get together and, and talk about these things. So, you know, there's various Facebook groups are a great place to start. I've started one called Thriving Families. It's a Facebook community that helps people who are families that are pursuing a life of financial independence and financial freedom. And we have a lot of those discussions about where they're starting, whether they're working on paying off credit card debt or they're working on, you know, investing for their financial independence and all the levels in between. So sometimes it's great to have somebody to lean on, somebody to get advice from, and it makes you feel like you're a part of a broader movement that is focusing on time freedom and happiness. Yeah, no, for sure. So, you know, like every movement has, you know, I'm sure fire is not free of this because we're all human after all. Every human can suffer the, the consequence of judgment that comes from it, right? Not just judgment for being in the FIRE lifestyle, but for judgment within the FIRE community as to how you're doing it. Tell us a little bit about how you've navigated that gaze, that judgment gaze, even within the community. Yeah, that's great. There's a, there's varying levels of everything, right? You know, so we talked about lean fire, fat fire, regular fire, all that. Yeah, and there's different people who have, you know, uh, objections to the movement, whether it's, hey, you have to be a six-figure earner or a white male in, in tech in order to make this happen. Um, and there's there's lots of folks that have um, you know, not only dispelled that myth, but then also just shown that it's not really that true as well. Uh, because there are there, everybody's finances are personal. That's why it's called personal finance, right? Yeah. So not everybody needs to fit into a mold of this is exactly what financial independence is. And if they're, if you're outside of that mold, then you're an outsider. I think if people have an open mind to what is important to that individual person, as opposed to what is the broad collective of what you're supposed to do, I think that uh, there can be a lot more acceptance, whether it's in financial independence or just generally in life. Uh, and I think that uh, that has become a broader movement uh, as as fire started out, maybe it was a little bit more stringent on what you're supposed to do. But as it grows, I think people are understanding there are varying levels of fire and you don't even have to invest or buy real estate. You can just find work that you love. And, and the essence of financial independence and the fire movement is all about trying to put forth the most important things in your life and trying to find a way to have more time for those. So I think if people bear that in mind as they're considering the FIRE movement, then there'll be less judgment. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you, looking the way I do, I'm very attracted to the FIRE movement. So <laughs> just to give a little bit of shout out of the diversity within FIRE. Uh, Absolutely. Tell us a little bit. Of, so I'm, we're going to shift to some questions that folks have um, that have asked us um, to, to direct at you. Tell us a little bit about, before we shift to that, though, where can people connect with you and listen to your podcast? Yeah, so I started a podcast called Marriage, Kids, and Money, and it is a weekly show that talks pretty much just about this, helping young families build wealth and happiness, trying to figure out ways that you can thrive. So you can check that out on all major podcast players. Um, my website is marriagekidsandmoney.com, a great place to connect. Thank you. Oh, our pleasure. Um, it, was, it was fun having this conversation with you. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. So the first question comes from Greg M. So Greg asks, how do you handle health insurance with high costs when not employee when it's not employer sponsored 
That's a great question. It's something I just went through recently, Greg, um, because I left my traditional employment where I had incredible benefits. And that was something that I was like, oh, man, can I really leave this? I'm getting great pay and great benefits. But uh, what I realized is that I could go on the exchange and find a great plan that was exactly the same as what I was you know, having at my last job. But for full transparency, I had such great benefits at my last job, I was paying nothing in monthly premiums. But now I am paying $1,200 per month in monthly premiums to have that same coverage. So shout out to my company, my former company that really supported me uh, and helped my family, you know, be protected. But yes, there is a cost to it. Um, but getting it is pretty simple. It took me a couple hours online at healthcare.gov to get a great coverage. Uh, there's some other people who do health health share ministries. Um, or, you know, if you've got a, a spouse that has the opportunity to get benefits too, that's a that's another way to go. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Yes, there's a cost to it. Um, and it's something you need to factor into your early retirement plan or your financial independence plan if you want to move out of traditional retirement. But it's definitely doable. It uh, It didn't take that long. But yes, there's a cost to it. Great. So I'm going to butcher this gentleman's name, but it's Winston <laughs> Voorhees Townsend III. Oh, I like it. I know. It's quite a presence. So the question is, what are your experiences with people who fired up by moving to lower cost living countries like Mexico? And I've heard of Costa Rica as another example. Yeah, I've got a friend uh, named Jim White who uh, decided to move to Panama uh, for part of his early retirement plans. And that is something that he worked on very hard uh, for a long time to save up enough money. He had visited there, found that they loved the country, and they've been there for, I believe, almost six to nine months now. Uh, they seem very happy with the change. Uh, they've enrolled their child into schools there, and they're able to provide them a different culture, uh, a cultural exposure that they never would have gotten in the United States. So whether this ends up being a couple-year thing for them or a 25-year thing for them, I think either way, it's going to be an experience that the family will never forget. And it's also something that they can experience together. Yeah, you know, one of the things, and as we're waiting for more questions, I just, one of the things I love about folks who are in the fire movement is there's a kind of like a happy warrior element to them. Yes. You know, it, it doesn't feel like it's just like the system sucks and therefore it feels like it's sort of like, okay, this is what the system is. How could I design it in a way that works for me, which I think is so, it's such an empowering uh, way of looking at life. So I really, I, I love that. So Aaron Laughlin asks you this, can you comment on strategies for pursuing fire with kids? Like for instance, mm -hmm. how should you save for college in a 529 or other sources of saving? Yeah, that's a great question. I have, uh, I can answer from my perspective, I've prioritized starting 529 savings for my ch uh, children, both when they were born, just because I knew the power of compound interest. You got to start early and you have to start and keep consistently uh, each month uh, contributing. So 529 savings has been important. Uh, traditional retirement savings was also important for me too, making sure that I had a cushion to make sure that I'm able to retire, retire before pre-retirement. It's almost like I want to make sure that I'm able to regularly retire when I really need to stop working before I think about, you know, this sort of pre-retirement. So uh, I, if I were to prioritize things, which I have done in my journey, it's, it's being able to retire uh, at a regular age of 60 plus, and then being able to allow my kids to you know, go to college without the burdens of student loans. Even so, we are not going to be able to save enough for our kids through our 529 for them to go student debt free by the time 2030 and 2032 rolls around. So we've had a lot of discussions with them about the importance of contributing through work in high school as well as college. And we are very inspired by some of the folks that I've been able to speak to about how they were able to grab some great scholarships for their kids by doing things like Scholarship Sunday, where they sit down every Sunday and their kids have to fill out at least one or two scholarship applications during their junior and senior year in order to take a huge bite out of their potential student, uh, student debt that they would have had. So I think it's just being intentional and looking at different ways to slice up the pie and figuring out how you can you know, attack a lot of these, uh, these goals you have. Yeah. And also, frankly, not thinking that there's only one normal, right? Yes. It's okay for you to sort of design a different one. So while we're waiting for the next question, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, investing. 
And yeah. so, you know, one of the things you said was investing in real estate, that turned into sort of, okay, not for us per se, not from a landlord perspective, but then you came back to the market to some extent, right? Um, tell us a little bit about what you've seen and, you know, the phenomenon that's happening in the marketplace where investing is infinitely easier for individuals now. Mm -hmm. Cost of entry is lower, cost of managing your money is lower. Um, and the information that's available to end users for self-directed end users is, is plenty at this point. Tell us a little bit about how that revolution has also helped you uh, for that piece of your wealth accumulation. Absolutely, yes. Uh, as you've said, the, there's been a massive change, even in just the last five years, with the ease of being able to invest you know, through platforms like Ally Invest that just makes it very simple for people to jump in the game right and so uh, you know as as there's also been like a fee war that's been going on as well that's been great for the consumers that make it uh not only easy to invest but also extremely inexpensive so you can jump in and become an investor for little to nothing um whether it's uh you know the expense ratios that are super low or the trading fees that are zero or or you know very minimal that allow you to come in and uh you know what you couldn't do decades ago and become an investor easily from your cell phone or from your laptop. So I love the changes that have been happening and the transparency around the fees has been a great uh, shift in the financial services industry as well. And I think it's uh, a great way to know that, hey, if you're paying, you never know exactly what you're going to make in the market, but you do know exactly what you're going to be paying in order to be an investor. So when those fees are as low as possible, that is a great, great, uh, you know, great news for you. Obviously, the, you know, with the market uh, like it is, you never know what's going to happen. But knowing what you're going to pay is a great, great thing to know ahead of time. Yeah. I've always said the market is one place where you want to do long-term investing because, as you can see, what's happening here, um, when you're not long-term oriented, it can spook a lot of people. Yeah, so you absolutely. got a question now from Classic Mini, mini DIY. Okay. I love that. <laughs> uh, what are some of the tips uh, for finding a financial advisor? Some of the good oh. questions they should ask when they find a financial advisor. That's a great that's a great question and something that I learned through trial and error through my journey too. I had connected with a uh, I'll call him an investment broker really uh, through my journey and I didn't ask enough questions. Uh, I just assumed that this is a professional and they're going to take care of me. And from what I learned down the road, I should have asked a lot more questions regarding fees. You want to know how they are being paid whether it's through third-party sources or through the fees that are gonna be taken from your account. So getting a clear understanding of how they're going to be paid is so important before you make a decision to move forward. A great question to ask too is if they are a fiduciary, somebody that is legally and ethically bound to work on your behalf, to work on your best interest and not theirs. That is a subset of the financial advising community. And it's a good question to ask to make sure that you aren't just being sold products that work well for them, but you are being uh, directed in a way that most benefits your financial journey. And making sure that they understand your ins and outs of your financial journey and the path that you're on. And if you're interested in financial independence and making sure that they feel comfortable with those types of questions. I've had a lot of luck with uh, XY Planning Network. Uh, there are a group of uh, you know fee-only financial adv advisors, uh, uh, CFPs, that uh, are really out there to help people win. Yeah. No, those are some savvy questions. Tell us, um, so the, the Richard W. asks you, what is your approx, and you can feel, feel free to pass if you want, but sure. what is your approximate monthly budget? <sighs> It's been shifting a lot lately because of our new entrepreneurial journey, but really on average, we're spending maybe sixty to seventy thousand dollars per year. So you know we're in that let's call it like six thousand dollar a month kind of uh, you know uh, annual expense or monthly expenses. So with that, you know that's without a mortgage too. So we've been able to you know, uh, recently over the past couple of years, increase our spending on things that we love, like traveling, giving more, you know, kids activities, going on date nights with my wife, and then reducing the expenses that don't bring us a lot of joy, like paying off our mortgage, getting rid of that, 
you know, uh, reducing, uh, saving enough where we can go into high deductible insurance plans, you know, reducing our spending on groceries. So it's sort of balanced of looking at the things that made us really happy and say, how do we spend more on that? And then looking at the things in our budget that didn't make us that happy and say, how do we spend less on those things? So that's kind of where we are right now. Great advice, great advice. So we have time for one more question, and this one comes from Julie Hale. And she asks, what can you do to beef up your retirement income after you've moved into retirement phase? Mm. Well, if we're talking about traditional retirement, I guess it's really both versions. Um, there is nothing wrong with doing a little bit of work of things that you love, right? So let's say you've moved into traditional retirement or early retirement for that matter. There is no police saying you can't work. You can't do things that you still love. So are there things, are there hobbies or things that you can easily monetize that make you happy where you can work, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week where it's not overwhelming you? So spending a little bit of time thinking about well, what what is what is work that I would do for free that makes me really happy that makes me feel like I'm giving back and then figuring out a way hey does that work does that hobby does that passion does it have an opportunity to to be monetized whether it's through consulting work or writing, or just a side hustle that just makes you happy. So I guess looking at ways that you can add a little bit of work into your retired life um, can make a big difference and. And it can also help you maybe hit your retirement goals a little earlier. Great advice. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you, Andy. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing your insights and your lived experiences with folks. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Lule. Take care. Take care.